Hello, my name is Daz Saunders. I am from England, and it will soon be my fourth year in Montreal since moving here. Currently, I am a student studying my master's in linguistics. I am researching and analyzing three different languages, Langue des Signes Québécois, American Sign Language, and Langue des Signes Francaise. I am a social activist in different areas, wherein I support the LGBT rights, deaf rights, as well as deaf LGBT rights, and the linguistic rights of the deaf communities and the official recognition of our languages. My name is Pamela Witcher, and I'm from Montreal. I am an artist. The movement is shown through my art. By that, I mean they raise awareness and education about the deaf experience through DIVIA, which stands for Deaf View Image Art. I'm also an activist in many venues, but at the moment, my main mission is currently with an organization I co-founded called Group BWB. Our mission is quite strong. We've been established for the last three years. Our mission is to generate public awareness about anti-autism, services without barriers, as well as a society without barriers. Of course, I do have a few other jobs go on going. I am a museum technician, consultant, presenter, interpreter, translator, video editor, no matter what position I hold, I always seem to have one foot in activism. You mentioned autism before and how it is a form of selective seclusion. Do you mind expanding further on that? What else does autism mean? And what does your company, uh, Group w B W B, do about autism? Well, the term autism was coined by a gentleman from the United States by the name of Tom Humphreys in the 70s. He had consulted with many members of the deaf community about the term. Though it was new for everyone, it just seemed to make sense. So it was a consensus amongst them that it was an appropriate term to describe their intent. I'm not sure if it was about a year or two ago that the term autism actually made it into the American Heritage Dictionary. So. The definition that describes autism is to base one's superiority solely on the fact of whether or not they can hear or speak. Those unable to are therefore inferior. And with that, those who can hear and speak are smarter. It's a very phonocentric system developed to suit the needs of the general public, thus creating a stigma against anyone who's a visual communicator or deaf. They're cast away and shut out. That's what autism is. So you work against autism or to abolish? To reduce, right. To reduce, right. Has there been anything that you've seen, whether or not you were directly involved or whether you were simply an observer, that had to do with the language rights of both communities? Well, Montreal has two systems. One, English ASL, American Sign Language, and the other, French LSQ, Langue des Signes Québécoises. The LSQ French were taught by French Catholic nuns as well as priests. Boys and girls went to separate schools, of which now have closed. Um, now kids go to Ecole Gabois for elementary school and Lucien Paget for high school. The English ASL community has always had the same Protestant structured education at Mackay Centre School, which has both elementary and high school. The high school program has switched back and forth between the Mackay Centre and Royal Vale site. I don't know why. Um, maybe it's because they didn't have the right foundation or maybe they didn't have the right resources to offer. Growing up in school, I was never taught about heritage, deaf heritage. Well, maybe a few teachers mentioned it, but, but not at great length. My parents never really exposed me to the political side. So growing up, I was unaware of the political issues that had surrounded me. My neighbor at the time when I was 11 years old, she was an LSQ Francophone. Yeah, and she invited me over to Gadbois on their parent-teacher evening. There was such a large gathering of LSQ, I was like, wow, it was a whole new world for me. Recently, now that we're older, an LSQ friend of mine was saying, oh, I had never been to Dawson College or McGill University. I had no, no idea what they looked like. And I replied, yeah, same goes for me. I had never seen UCAM or Cégep de vieux Montréal. So really, they're two completely separate systems. Yes, two parallel worlds. That's right. So how did I get involved in the LSQ community? Well, 
there were deaf clubs, there were hockey clubs, and through that I was able to pick up more and more LSQ over time. So for me, the way I see it, my personality is more pacifist in that I believe in working together. I was never really conscious about the heated tension between the linguistic communities, be it ASL and LSQ or English and French. I had no idea. Um, it, it was not a big issue for me, but I had noticed a bit of tension here and there, and I have seen negative comments made by both communities towards one another. I don't quite understand why. For me, they're both people, so I just stay involved in both groups. It does disappoint me. My dream is to see an alliance. I've been very involved in the LSQ community, but still, the LSQ community, not everyone, but some in the community, uh, like my peers, they're very supportive, open-minded, and understanding of ASL and LSQ working together in regards to the issues. But some of them, politically speaking, for example, they might see me as threatening because of my support for diversity, uh, be it uh, the importance of involving immigrants, the ASL community, as well as the gay and lesbian rights groups. But those who are Quebecois pure laine, they're very protective of their LSQ language and resist outside influence. But if you want power of votes and freedom of expression, deaf rights, we have our own common struggles of staff issues within a system that has not been listening to us as citizens. And to continually be focused on issues only relating to LSQ, LSQ takes away from deaf issues um, similarly occurring in both communities. And if we work together, we are greater in numbers and therefore stronger as a whole, and we can come together and vote on the same issues because really our struggles are the same. The only difference is our language. Well, in terms of oppression, there are some differences as well. I had taken a course in university called Quebec Politics, and it was there that I had learned why Quebec wanted to separate. We learned about the ongoing protests in the FLQ, the transportation industry at that time, specifically the Canadian railroad system, refused to hire French-speaking citizens. The industry was run by the English. Hearing about all of these oppressive struggles really touched me, and I began to understand why the French wanted to separate, why the LSQ didn't like the ASL. I got it. Maybe it's because I'm part of a minority myself, I'm ASL, I'm a woman, and the simple fact that I'm deaf. So yes, I could definitely relate to what the French minority must have been feeling, and for that they have my support. Yes, I see. You were speaking just now about how both the LSQ and ASL communities exist as minorities. You feel the ASL is smaller in ratio to the LSQ in Quebec, but how the LSQ is also a minority in Canada. I'd like to ask you, as both communities strive to gain rights, do you feel like either one can or will contribute something learned onto the other community, or do these two communities operate separately? Well, the LSQ community is definitely larger in numbers. I've been driven to learn as much as possible about the LSQ language and its culture, both LSQ and French. Now I can easily converse between the four languages. It's been about, well, almost 20 years now that I've been immersed in the LSQ circle. I feel that they've adopted me. They welcomed me into their community. ASL or LSQ or whatever the issues are, it isn't so important to me. The issue at hand is deaf rights, inclusiveness, and continuing the various movements that I've been involved in. Throughout time, however, the lack of ASL services is realized and the deaf identity has diminished. There is no central place to go to so that we can come together. There aren't any deaf clubs. The infrastructure has changed, schools have closed, programs have been transferred, student population has diminished due to the fact that mainstreaming has increased. Nowadays, deaf individuals are isolated. The community has lost its drive. When I worked at Mackay, I tried to alert them to these issues. For yourself in your everyday life as a deaf person, are there any um, uh, issues that you're currently involved in? Some movements going on here in Quebec. Would you mind explaining? For example, there is an International Deaf Day in Quebec. I did partake in a collective march. It brings visibility that we are here. It's an annual event that I make a habit of participating in. That's one example. But for me as a person, my involvement in movements are twofold. Uh, primarily, it's because of my arts. And secondly, 
well, eight artists sign an agreement of what Divya means by creating guidelines and a manifesto. At that time, I knew a bit about Divya, but I didn't realize its full extent. I just had a taste of the concept. One of my mentors, who is an artist, expressed various frustrations, like growing up when signing was forbidden. These experiences that were thrown out on canvas were just powerful, but for some reason she did not want to show these pieces in public. She feared judgment by those who may look upon them, but she kept telling me how important it is to show my deaf experience and how I should really express my truth through my art, and those words stuck with me. We eventually lost touch, but my paintings were originally focused more on the feminine spirit, uh, started to evolve to focus more on the deaf experience. From that point on, people who viewed my works referred to me as a Divya artist, though I haven't been involved in that scene for a while. Actually, Canada has its own um, ever-growing network of deaf artists through organizations like Spill Propaganda and Photocentrism. Dash Deconstruction. And we've established our own manifesto as activist artists. They're all deaf in that group? Yes, we are 11 deaf artists from across Canada together in this movement. And just like the Divya movement, which recently celebrated its 25th anniversary, I was also featured in that exhibition. And now we have a movement here and Europe has its own artistic movement as well. And another project that I've been heavily involved with is an organization called Group BWB that I co-founded three years ago along with two other deaf women. What began as a small startup of just the three of us has quickly grown into a network of numerous presenters. Our mission is to advocate for human rights as well as to educate the public about breaking autism and how to offer services and education without barriers. Gary Markowski, who was our mentor, um, he's also the first deaf MPP in Toronto. He's a very well-known presenter and passionate about speaking out against um, ableism and autism and what it means to provide services without barriers. And after my fellow co-founders and I had our training with Mr. Bukowski, we returned to Quebec to get started on our mission. Really, it's become a high demand and deaf people are craving for more information that will bring them a better understanding of our internal struggles with our daily frustrations of where we come from. Finally, we were able to put a word to that internal feeling of angst and struggle by understanding ableism and autism, and we were able to make others aware of these human rights. And today it's quite, these concepts are hot topics. Museum of Human Rights built out in Winnipeg recently opened its doors and I've been involved at the Accessibility Committee to promote equal access within museums. This is an opportunity to make a significant impact across Canada as with equal access applies to sexism, racism, and honestly now is the perfect time to make the public aware of autism and how it affects deaf individuals. Yet, the term is still not widely accepted. It's still treated with resistance. It's actually ironic because you have the hearing population who's encouraged to teach their baby sign language and many applaud that trend. Yet, when a baby is born deaf, the medical system wants to try to fix that child. There's no mention to the parents about teaching them sign language to help the language development of their babies. They delay the process and solely try to make the child hear somehow. They discourage signing and focus on the problem that needs to be fixed. It's been like that for over 400 years. So our mission is to try to take, change this by telling everyone how important it is it is to sign, especially for development. Yes, with every fiber of me, everything I do, everything I say I'm involved in, it's all part of a movement in one way or another. The way I go about my day, I talk to people, especially in the deaf community, we're always discussing issues that are close to, really close to my heart. Starting to become focused on the ASL English community in comparison to going back to how it had been when I was growing up, now there's no place for gatherings. The last five years or so with the Mackay Center had closed its location of services. Things were changed and they emerged with the Montreal Association of the Blind. So really the deaf, really deaf people feel lost. There's no connection anymore. And the Montreal Association of the Deaf had become dormant. ASL of Montreal, ASLM, had closed its doors and they used to teach American Sign Language classes. So much has been lost over the years. Now we're trying to bring the community back to life. A group of us were discussing these issues and decided to try to gather the community through hosting monthly events. And we're coming up to our second meeting, so we'll see where it goes from there. 
I think through spreading the word of our um, by our presentations around to everyone and on a societal level, there's also a need for some protesting from the grassroots. Well, I don't mean only the grassroots. When I say that word, what I mean is people of the community. So people from our community need to work together to stand up to show protest. A great example of this would be our protest for the video relay service. That be it's been an ongoing battle for the last five years. And finally, we did get a date approving service to access as of 2015. Now this was on a national level and we had to work closely with our MNAs, our members of National Assembly. Ministers? No, members of National Assembly. And we had to negotiate with them. They would bring our demands up to the CRTC and then the MNAs would come back with their counter offers. Meanwhile, we had to get the word out to the community through vlogs about the video relay service and what it was. On several occasions during those years, local communities also managed to stage nationwide rallies simultaneously. So we had three ongoing initiatives and it was a success. And you yourself were involved in organizing that, correct? Yes, I was involved in the community at the beginning because like I said with the ASL and LSQ, actually that brings me to another point I was talking about. In British Columbia, there was a committee that was trying to get in contact with the deaf community in Quebec because they wanted to get the LSQ population involved, but for some reason there was no response. It could have been a language thing. Maybe they were having a hard time understanding the language of the email. So eventually the BC committee had forwarded the original email to me and I had translated it into French and sent it off to the LSQ community. But still there was no reply, not even to me. So it was quite puzzling. It might have been some kind of political thing, I don't know. But if everything moved forward on a national level without the involvement of the LSQ community, and if services were established only in the ASL language, the LSQ community would suffer again. And there would be no service for them. So we need to understand that the ASL community has had previous experience with the VRS system since it's been well established in the US for quite some time. The LSQ community doesn't have the same experience. I feel that part of it just has to do with ignorance and we need to have them understand how important VRS really is for us. I didn't know what to do, so I had I had told a few friends the whole situation and we ended up having a lengthy discussion about what our next step should be. One of my friends who's LSQ said, you know what, I'm just going to go ahead and work with you if you would become involved as well. And I said, okay, let's do it. And from there we worked tirelessly to get as much information out to everyone within the community. So back to what I meant about grassroots, I mean people from the community need to be the ones taking the action. So that is a good example of eventually both communities working together. Yes. That was monumental. The ASL and LSQ community working together as allies. It's really powerful. And it was successful. Yes, and it was successful. But it seems like when it came to a national level, yes, it worked out. But still on a provincial scale, in Quebec, it feels like the community is lost. I, quite honestly, sometimes feel lost myself. I don't know where the community is going. I think from many years growing up oppressed, be it in the school system, also being in the ASL community as part of my minority, continuously oppressed, I feel that we've just given up and that we've become passive, that there's no fight left in a lot of community. Of course, I don't mean everyone. There are still probably about 10% of us who are ready to roll up our sleeves to be active, to be an active front, then maybe the rest will follow. But it does take time. It's a huge undertaking. And we were recently trying to start over again. The goal would be to see the ASL and LSQ community come together. But is the LS ASL community currently strong enough for that at this time? Is it ready? I don't know. Right now, it's gonna take some time. It's, uh, it's gonna take some training through workshops and form individuals of their rights as citizens. Pamela, let's look back to what you were previously explaining, talking about something that had touched your very being and impacted you as a person. Where was that? Can you explain it again? And where was it exactly? Yeah, um, I was talking about two different things. One has to do with being deaf in the system, and the other one has to do with being ASL English within Quebec. Now, going back to being deaf in the system, it was, I think it was back in the summer of 1993, just after graduating high school, and there was this deaf woman. Her name was Dr. Tannis Doe. So, this woman, Dr. Tana Stowe, was extremely active. She was truly an activist, a feminist. She fought for gay lesbian rights. She supported the anti-autism movement. Yes, she was deaf. Well, hard of hearing, but she communicated in sign language. 
anyway, she has since passed, which is sad, but at that time, when I first saw her, she was hosting an event, part of the CAD, Canadian Association for the Deaf Youth Initiative, where they invited only six deaf youths from across Canada to go to this international hearing youth seminar in Victoria Island, Pearson College. Yeah, we were all together. We were there mingling. It was quite an experience. I really looked up to her. You know, she adopted a black daughter. She was a feminist, a rebel, an advocate for deaf issues. She spoke out on various left-wing issues. I hadn't seen a deaf true blood activist, so I was really intrigued by her. As the conference continued, there were various events, but one really stood out. It was a presentation by a deaf man named Vincent Chauvet. And he spoke about the deaf culture. Then he talked about the Deaf President Now movement, which took place at Gallaudet University. That's when I felt a connection. My whole life, I had never heard such greatness. I wasn't taught those kinds of things. It was mind-blowing and unforgettable. I was sitting there crying, bawling my eyes out in the middle of the audience. I was just having flashes of my internal struggles up to that point. With hearing aids in my ears, I felt grief and sorrow, my identity struggle, communication barriers, it all came back. And that's when it hit me and I decided to take off my hearing aids. I came back home to Quebec a new person. I took out as many books as I could read and became really immersed in the issues and I've been that way ever since. Okay, so absorbed in books. But in what ways did you bring the impact of that experience here to Quebec? When I returned to Quebec, I started setting up my own workshops. I would initiate group discussions. I had also worked on an ASL after school program for adults. There were around 30 people who came to talk about what it was like to grow up in the system and to grow up under the Makai umbrella. It was really an emotional experience. At one point, an administrator from Makai had heard about the meetings and approached me to say that as long as we're on the property of Makai, we're not allowed to speak against the institutions. So it became a taboo and we had to stop talking about it. That's just one example to, uh, to show that as an ASL community, there's no safe place for us to freely express ourselves. Yes, the LSQ community organized an open forum as they want to set up their own organization, a political one, but they don't want the ASL community to be involved. They don't want the ASL community to have the right to vote. But some of us are trying to tell them how important it is to include the ASL community. It would increase their numbers and power of votes and we can fight together. But no, it seems that the mindset of those in charge only want to deal with, as we say, the Quebecois Piolin. They only want to be among their own. So I feel conflicted. On one hand, I see the positive side to this happening and they have my support. Yet on the other hand, it goes against my values. Another example um, of ASL as a recognized language or having the recognition of an official language. For the LSQ community, it's been a long-standing dream and battle to have their language recognized as an official language of Quebec. And I supported them in their fight. When I said to them, hey, please, can you include the ASL in your request for recognition of official languages? Because this battle will also impact the ASL community existing in and around Montreal. The LSQ community didn't say anything. It was as if, as if they didn't want to discuss it or that it might take them off course and be a conflict to Bill 101. But Quebec also has to support its Anglophone rights too, so it was just not comfortable. That's something I struggle with. I want to be there to support the LSQ community, but at the same time, I feel like the ASL community is weak. They need to be able to stand up and fight. Well, maybe not fight, but... They need to be present and active in discussions with the LSQ community. As it stands now, I don't see that happening for a while, not really. Maybe I'm wrong. It could be that the ASL community is more prepared than I think. Maybe if we put it up for a debate, we might find more the initiative than what I'm assuming. Given an opportunity in a space where everyone could feel comfortable to express themselves freely, maybe things could happen. We could finally have a tangible discussion about our rights and and ASL identity and such, but I haven't given that a chance, so I don't know. It's funny how you have the majority of the LSQ community oppressing the minority ASL community because of the fact that the majority of ASL communities for a long time have oppressed the minority LSQ communities on a much larger scale. It's a vicious cycle and we need to cut the strings somewhere. I try to snip here and there through what feels to be a ghost web, 
it's not working. It seems to me that we need to work through the issues slowly. I think the mission right now for the ASL community is to develop a strong foundation before they're ready to work together as allies with the LSQ community. Yeah. So we've spoken about your upbringing, your recent endeavors, and now let's talk about the future. Given the chance to have a good sit-down discussion with the LSQ and ASL community, what are some of the things that you would advise them to think deeply of and watch out for in the future? Uh, oh, for example, maybe advising them in regards to their wishes to improve their rights. You've witnessed several advances for the deaf community. These are successes, but there are some battles yet to be won. Not wanting other activists to repeat some past mistakes, what would you caution them against in the future? I'm still trying to figure it out for myself. It's almost as if the deaf world is in a bubble, having their own battles and struggles. I often see the case as lack of visibility. Many hearing people are not aware of our issues and how we live our lives. So, as I was discussing with community members, it comes down to the importance of taking part in others' battles. Just as you see for First Nation rights, the protests on the economy and gas line and oil issues, environmental issues, animal rights, if the deaf community start getting involved in these other issues, they will become visible as signers, and one day those initiatives would appreciate this support and will take turn being supported to the deaf community. At the same time, I am feeling concerned. It makes me wonder if 50 years from now, deaf children will become invisible after they are grown up and they finally look to the community, to, they discover sign language, yet they have no knowledge of their own history that everything is new for them, while the ironic thing is, is that they're deaf themselves. As a community, we have to continuously teach them about their history and culture. It's an endless cycle. Now, there's this um, policy. No. Wait, what's it called? Yes, it's a policy, preserving old buildings to become historical buildings. But, unfortunately, that policy wasn't established until 1960, 65 or so. Something like that it's this new policy that puts a cessation on demolitions. Before that, many heritage buildings were demolished over the years, including the original Mackay School building. My parents witnessed the tearing down of that great building. They were devastated. It was their home. It was their family. I had my history within those walls. Now it's gone. It's a familiar story to many deaf schools. It's not just an institution. It's a precious place where people came together and gathered and mingled. Now you have kids thrown into the mainstream system individually, and they're spread far and wide. Technology has changed. Everything is moving quickly nowadays with increased stresses in daily life. Believe me, I think it's great the advances in technology, especially for communication for signers. Hearing people are more interested in learning sign language and are open to our issues, therefore become more involved in the community. That's great. On the other side, I have mixed feelings because many students are being isolated through the mainstream system. In the next 50 years, I don't know. Now we are continuing our battles. So it looks like hearing people need to be aware in order to understand our battles. What is your dream of what we will have, say, in 50 years from now? Not what you hope for, but what you dream of, specifically regarding the ASL deaf community, and maybe for all deaf people all over the province. My dream would be to have complete access in terms of accessibility. I want to see deaf people fully involved in society where they have 100% equality. Deaf people can work their way up the professional ladder and have access to managerial roles as well as administration. I want to see deaf people be able to work wherever they want and become a pilot or a doctor with zero barriers. I'd like to see the deaf education standards improve because that has an impact on their identity as well. Yeah, furthermore, I'd like to see the ASL and LSQ interpreters be more on demand. This would mean that the ASL and LSQ interpreters would be able to linguistically coexist yet keep their ties to their respective communities. However, in terms of lobbyism, I want to see them fight alongside each other and work together. That's what I hope to see. The communities would become more powerful. And of course, I am continuing my art because I feel art is very powerful medium as well. So this is, as I say, the first LSQ article to be published in a hearing magazine. See that image? You can go to the website and click on the link to see the text signed in LSQ. 
It explains the linguistic minorities in battle. It gives a brief history of Milan, among other things. That's one example of a project that I've been involved with. You were saying that you were an activist, not only through Groupe BWVD, but also as an artist and in other ways. You also mentioned how the population of the ASL deaf community in Quebec is dwindling. Suppose a member of that community asked you for advice. They want to plan and organize, do all that they can to further the community's rights. What would you tell them? It's important to have passion deep down inside and to believe in success. Those two things are important. Mm -hmm.